No, you're okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Allison Arwady, Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, and the goal for today is to give an update on our COVID-19 data and take questions. So as always, we are starting with our update for the travel order. As of today, Chicago's travel order consists of 25 states and Puerto Rico. We are adding Indiana as well as North Carolina, Rhode Island, and New Mexico. As a reminder, states go on to this list if they have an average number of new cases of more than 15 new cases per 100,000 residents per day. Obviously, the Indiana news is of significance to many people in Chicago, and I do want to remind people specifically who it applies to. So for Wisconsin and Indiana and all of the other states under the travel order, this order does apply to individuals coming from Wisconsin or Indiana to Chicago for non-work purposes and to Chicago residents returning from Wisconsin or Indiana unless they are deemed an essential worker. I want to clarify that students who regularly travel over the Indiana-Illinois border for school are also exempt from this order. Other exceptions to the order for personal travel are allowed for medical care and parental shared custody. Individuals who travel to Wisconsin or Indiana, even if for less than 24 hours, still need to quarantine upon returning, unless deemed an essential worker, a regularly commuting student, or one of the other exceptions. Chicago residents are strongly advised not to travel to these states. I also want to give an update on our Chicago data. So first and foremost, we are seeing an increase in cases. Our average case count today over the last seven days is 364 cases per day. I expect this number to continue to increase. And in fact, I expect that this number will cross the 400 mark likely this week. And I want to talk a little bit about why I expect that to be true. First, I'll point out that that 364 number is an increase of 10% over just one week ago when we were at 332 cases. That certainly is cause for concern. It certainly cause for everybody to double down on the things that we know work. Wearing your masks, keeping your distance, washing your hands, protecting vulnerable residents. But the news also needs to be in the context of our testing rates. First of all, our test positivity rate remains low at 4.4%. As a reminder, we want to keep our test positivity rate below 5%. And Chicago is doing second best in the state of Illinois related to test positivity. The region that includes Urbana-Champaign has the lowest test positivity, largely because the University of Illinois is doing a lot of testing in that context. But Chicago is next lowest. So that's good news, but we'd like to continue to see that number come down further. I also want to highlight what our test positivity looks like by zip code. As you can see on the map and as we will post on our website, we continue to see the southwest and northwest sides of the city remaining highest in terms of test positivity, highest in terms of new cases. But please hear this. We continue to see new cases of COVID-19 diagnosed every week out of every zip code in Chicago. And we need everybody to do their part, particularly as the weather is getting colder. You can see on this map that the areas, areas in darkest blue have a test positivity that ranges from eight to 13%, meaning between eight and 13% of all the tests that are done are positive, uh, which is more than twice what the city's average uh, test positivity is. I also want to highlight that our hospitalization numbers and our death numbers remain stable here in Chicago. 
You can look online to see more details, but as you can see in the graphs here, we continue to admit on average fewer than 15 new Chicago residents to the hospital every day with COVID-19. That's down from more than 150 residents being admitted every day back at our peak uh, in April and May. Similarly, we continue to see between two and three Chicago residents die from COVID every day. Now that is still too many deaths and every one of these deaths, you know, has such ripple impacts in terms of families and neighborhoods that are impacted. That is though down from the approximately 50 deaths per day that we were seeing in Chicago. And so even while we are seeing some increases in cases, our new hospitalizations, our new emergency department visits, our deaths have remained stable and our hospital capacity remains adequate here in Chicago. I especially want to highlight some good news related to testing here in Chicago. So our seven day rolling average now for tests is at nearly 10,000 tests per day. Today it was at 9,977, the most testing that we have ever been doing in the city of Chicago. You see that cumulatively we've done more than 1.2 million tests. On average, one in four Chicagoans have been tested at least once. And when we count all the tests, we're doing just about 10,000 a day. Just a month ago, if you look back, we were doing about 7,000 to 8,000 a day. And I expect this number also to continue to grow. So you might remember that at the beginning, I mentioned that our cases have increased 10% as compared to last week at this time. Our tests have increased by 11% since last week at this time. And so this is highlighting that in part, the increase in cases that we are seeing is because of an increase in testing. It is not the full story, but it is part of the story. And I want people to understand that the reason we expect to see these cases continue to grow is partly reflected because of tests. So there are a couple of other metrics that we follow and that we've not talked about a whole lot publicly. We're going to increasingly be talking about them, putting them on the website and sharing them with all of you so that you know some of how we monitor how testing impacts case rate. First, this is just highlighting generally, you can see that our increase in cases do track fairly closely with our increase in tests. In the blue line here is what tests have looked like since reopening in uh, late June to the present. And then the light gray shows cases. And you can see that where we see tests dip, we often see cases dip and vice versa. We use an, a number called number needed to test to get a sense of how well testing is fitting in to our new case numbers here in Chicago. The idea is we follow how many people need to be tested in Chicago for COVID-19 to find one case. As of today, we have to test 24 people in Chicago to find one positive test result. And if you look back again since June moving forward, that purple line you can see has generally been flat, where we've been needing to test between approximately 18 and approximately 25 to 28 people to find one positive test result. We want that number to stay flat, and even better, we want it to be going up. And you can see over the last month, we've actually increased again from needing to test about 20 people to find an average case, I mean to find one case, to testing 24 people. So we continue to monitor that. We'll be sharing and talking more about it in the days and weeks to come. But this is one reason why we are broadly continuing to see stable and steady community transmission, even while we are seeing this increase in testing. Secondly, I wanted to begin talking about another metric that we follow. Again, you'll have more opportunity to learn about this. We'll be putting more up on our website. None of this is new data. It's just another way of sharing the same data that we've been following all along. So there's a number called the reproduction number, 
also known as R. You might have heard, to, heard it referred to as R0 or RT. Basically, it means the average number of people who are infected by each person with COVID-19 in Chicago. So the reproduction number is about how well is the virus reproducing. If the RT is two, this means that every one person in Chicago with COVID spreads to, on average, two other people. And that might not sound so bad. One person spreading to two other people does not sound like a very infectious disease. And in fact, there are many diseases that are more infectious than that. But what you see in this graph on the right is that very quickly, if one person in red there is spreading to two people, and then those two people are spreading to two people, and then those two are spreading to two people, and so on, we very quickly see a big increase of cases in Chicago. Whereas if on average, one person in Chicago with COVID is spreading to an average of one other person, our outbreak actually stays flat, as you can see on the right. Spread to one, spread to one, spread to one. So our goal, of course, is to spread to an average of one or fewer people. And if we look back over time here, The higher that R is above one, the higher the reproduction number is above one, the faster COVID will spread. If the reproduction number is below one, infections will slow. Very early on in our outbreak here, like back in March, that reproduction number, that R in Chicago, was estimated at 3.62 which means that on average, way back at the beginning, every one person with COVID was spreading to between three and four other people on average. And that's why our cases were rising so quickly. When we successfully flattened the curve, what we did in epidemiologic terms was change the conditions to make it harder for the virus to reproduce. We stayed home, we wore masks, we socially distanced, we washed our hands. Each of those things dropped the R, dropped how well the virus was replicating, and we got it down so that our R was under one, as low as 0.85. And that means that each person with COVID-19 was spreading disease to an average of less than one other person, meaning that we had many infected people not spreading the disease at all. This is why we were able to get our outbreak in control. Our current reproduction number, our RT in Chicago at this time, that's what the T stands for, the, the reproduction number in time, is estimated at 1.0, specifically 1.013. And I know this is a lot of numbers, but I'll show you this graph. And again, we'll be talking more about this in the weeks to come. What you can see is that while we were under stay at home, and doing all of those things for the first time, this actually is that reproduction number. It, and that the, the black line there is one. One means a stable outbreak. It's not getting better, it's not getting worse. Below one means it's getting better. Above one, and particularly high above one, means it's out of control. So you can see back in May and June, we were able to get that really far under one. That's when we saw that peak really drop. And then with reopening, we've basically moved to having an R right around one. As of today, like I said, 1.01. .01. We want that reproduction number to stay at one or ideally get back below one. If we start to see it going up, meaning on average every one person is spreading to more than one other person, that is what pushes our outbreak back out of control. So this is, this is a very important way. This is actually the main way that most of the European countries have been using to monitor their outbreak. It gets you away a little bit from the individual case numbers, which can be harder to uh, follow with the changes in testing and allows us to understand where our outbreak is in Chicago. So the bottom line is that right now is the time to double down on what we know works. 
a reproductive number of just over one does not make me very happy. It does not make me extremely worried. But if we see this number going up, it means that our outbreak is out of control. If it stays where it's been, really June to October, even if the numbers are going up, as long as the testing and the other number is part of what's driving that, we remain broadly in control. But all around us, there is trouble. Wisconsin has a very poorly controlled outbreak. Indiana has a poorly controlled outbreak. Iowa, Missouri, and parts of downstate Illinois are not in as strong control as we are here in Chicago. And we are not in as strong control in Chicago this week as we were last week. So what I want you to hear is that now is the time to get even more serious. As we're moving indoors, as colder weather is coming, we know the things we need to do. And if we do these things, I'm confident that we will be able to keep this outbreak broadly in control. But this is not a positive direction that we're heading. I don't want to see it getting worse. And ideally, I want to see it turn around the other direction. So please don't be surprised when you see the case numbers go up. We'll be helping explain this in the context of changes in testing and make decisions as we need to moving ahead. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, you, you touched on this, obviously, with Indiana, but I'm wondering if you could just kind of reiter reiterate, because we've gotten a lot of questions about commuters and students, and, and what are the rules around that? Yes. Um, so people who travel regularly to Indiana for work or who vice versa between Indiana and Chicago for work or for school regularly are exempt from this order. They may travel for those work-related purposes or those school-related purposes, uh, but they otherwise um, cannot be doing non-work or non-school-related activities while this is in place, or they would be subject to the quarantine order. OK, from NBC5, um, what indoor settings are the biggest risks? And what are the best ways to st stay safe while indoors? Do fans help? What about UV lights? OK, so there are a lot of things out sort of on the internet right now. And in general, people thinking a lot about how to keep um, indoor spaces as safe as possible. The main thing I want people to hear is that the most important thing for risk in an indoor space are the interactions with other living, breathing Chicagoans. And so for me, the safer indoor space is first of all going to be one where everybody is wearing their mask, everybody is keeping their six foot distance, and we're generally being very conscious of the way that we're interacting with each other. Obviously, a safer indoor space is one where you know everybody, you're avoiding large crowds, you know what, what the risks are, and those are the most important things. There's been some data around things like uh, ventilation and fans and this question about UV light. I would say that broadly, um, and there is guidance on the website if people are interested, if you go to chicago.gov slash coronavirus, there's information about ventilation on there, and the CDC has also put out additional information. We like to have more airflow. We like to have more outside air in. And so an easy thing for people to do is just crack your window a little bit. Larger buildings are able to change sometimes their, um, the amount of air that's coming in sort of from the outdoors, and we've seen that happen a lot. People who are running fans, you would want to run those sort of running outside, like pulling air out of a room um, as opposed to sort of pulling it in. And the UV lights, 
uh, in terms of the ones that you're able to just buy, I those would not be my the, my main recommendation. Uh, settings where they're using UV light appropriately are more um, in settings that they're they're very high. They're not they're not down um, inter, inter, interfacing with individuals where you can actually have exposure to radiation that we would not want. So I don't want individuals trying to go after UV light um, or or anything like that. Cracking your window. Um, if people are interested in in purchasing the air filters that can sit in the room, you can. Those are all additive. They do not replace the more important things, which remain the masking, the six foot distancing, the staying home if you're sick, the same things that we've been talking about for months. And also from NBC5 along the same lines, should you go into other people's homes? Hmm. So I can never give a yes, no answer to a question like that. Um, I think if you're going into someone's home, I can tell you how I make that decision. Uh, first, I are, is the home that I'm going in, is this somebody who is already in my bubble? Is this someone who is in my close family, for example, who we are all already um, sharing risk and being careful with uh, people outside that? If it is not somebody in my bubble, I broadly, I'm not going into other people's homes at this point. If I'm able to meet outside, that is what I personally prefer to do. But if I'm going into somebody's home, I am definitely wearing that mask and keeping my distance. Um, I I'm not militant about this. Um, I don't, you know, for people who had a more serious underlying condition uh, or someone in their bubble who has a serious underlying condition or who is older, you are going to have to make your own decisions there. So generally speaking, always fewer interactions are safer from a COVID perspective. If you think back to the think twice messaging that we did here, um, safer activities broadly are ones that are avoid crowds where everybody can wear a mask, everybody can keep a six foot distance, and they're out of doors. As out of doors is less of an option, you got to double down on those other things. Okay, from Block Club, um, the Lincoln Park area is seeing a new uptick in cases. What's driving the spike in cases in that area? So we saw, I think this is probably referring to some of the hotspot analysis that we've been sharing on the website. So we have consistently seen hotspots, uh, and a hotspot just means more cases than one would expect for a given week. We've consistently seen hotspots over the northwest and the southwest, and sometimes a little bit on the very far southeast. Uh, but over the last few weeks, we had seen some hotspot in the, the near north area, and I presume that's what this is referring to. And the team actually did some really interesting investigations uh, looking at this and comparing what do we see differently in terms of spread in different parts of the city. And so looking at, for example, that near north hotspot and comparing it to the northwest or the southwest hotspot, I can tell you that that near north hotspot uh, did have a lot of younger people. So it had a lot of people in the 18 to 39 year old group who were confirmed cases, whereas that was less true in the um, northwest and southwest spots. We also saw more cases in that northwest section affiliated or, or um, associated with not family as much. Only 12%, as I recall, in that in that uh, near north area, cases had known contact with a family member with COVID, whereas 30% had contact with a friend with uh, COVID. Uh, we're also more likely to have contact with a coworker uh, or acquaintance, whereas in the northwest and southwest, we were much more seeing spread within families and within households. So in the southwest, it was nearly two thirds where there was exposure to a known case. It was in that family setting. Um, and really the inverse of where if people did know or had a good guess of who they had potentially been exposed to with COVID in that north, in the, in the north area, 75% um, of the time, it was at a non-household location, whereas on the southwest side, um, it was really the inverse, like almost 75% of the time, it was at a household location. And I think it just highlights the, the, the different risk factors. I'm not sure if I mentioned travel, but also a third of the, in, in the near north, a third of the people with COVID reported travel outside Illinois, whereas in the northwest and southwest, it was only like five or 6% of cases. And so it just highlights that there are risk factors for spread that are different um, in some ways in different parts of the city. And where we look at some of the more entrenched hotspots um, on the Northwest and Southwest, those are 
areas that have more essential workers. Um, they also are areas that have more crowded housing and more people generally living together. On the near north side, I think the average number of home, uh, number of people in a home of someone with COVID was like 1.9, whereas on the northwest and southwest, it was over three and even over four, I believe. And these are the kinds of structural factors that can make it harder um, to control COVID in, in some of the parts of the city where we've more consistently seen it. We have seen improvement in that near north hotspot, and we actually think some of it was probably associated with some more gathering uh, and travel related to Labor Day, and we're, and we're past that in some ways. So I have, you know, again, I'm concerned about every area of the city, anywhere where we're seeing any potential increase, but I think some of the structural differences um, that we see more in the northwest and the southwest are where, um, as you saw in the map I showed, the positivity is still higher and certainly where the health department is mainly directing resources related to testing. We investigate all cases in the city as a reminder, doesn't matter where you live, um, but those are some of the differences that we see. So uh, reminder to everybody, no matter where you live, don't travel if you if you can help it. Um, if you have you know if if you're if you're at home, um, be careful because that is a space where we continue to see the majority of the spread of COVID, um, and that's even more true in the parts of the city that are uh, most heavily impacted right now. Also from Block Club, uh, for people who have been isolating and staying home entirely because they are medically vulnerable to coronavirus, how can they safely get a flu shot? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. So. First, um, I would encourage people to make sure they're actually um, making an appointment for a flu shot. Um, so, for example, many, many pharmacies uh, will will let you make an actual time of appointment for a flu shot, and they are set up to be able to, ha to have sort of those early hours or, or the later hours where seniors in particular may be more able to come in. The other thing is to reach out to your healthcare provider, um, where again, you can make an appointment. And in fact, many, many healthcare providers uh, are doing some form of drive-through uh, flu shots. The health department is also um, sort of trialing some of this for flu in, in, in practice for what, what may be a portion of our COVID vaccine response. Um, but I would encourage people to get that flu shot. Um, obviously, if you're going to go out, you want to make sure you wear that mask and you're keeping your distance. Um, and don't just go out and, and start looking. Make sure you have an appointment and you're going uh, specifically to get the flu shot. Even people who are really socially isolating, I would encourage them to be checking in with their doctors um, because it's not just the flu shot. It's are their chronic diseases in good control? Do they have the meds they need? Um, and they can help you make a plan uh, for, for the flu shot in a way that, that will be very low risk to you. Okay, uh, Univision is asking, earlier this year, uh, we saw pushback from some churches regarding COVID restrictions and attendance caps. Uh, is that a thing of the past? Has everyone been cooperating? Okay, so there are churches just like any other gathering space are subject to the same gathering size limitations and those remain in place. Uh, we have broadly seen good cooperation with those and actually I've been very pleased to see a lot of the creative ways many people have managed to alter worship practices, whether that's thinking about different timing of services and being careful about not having people intermix, whether it's a lot of the things that have been able to move to online or virtual, um, or making sure that there's other ways for connecting outside of large services. I know that this is one of the areas that has been the hardest for many, many people in Chicago. Uh, it's, it's when times get tough, people, often turn to faith and make, you know, the fact that this is making it harder for people in some ways, you know, to gather in those traditional ways, I know has been a hard thing for folks here in Chicago, but I do want to broadly thank um, our religious communities for doing the right thing and following the guidance in terms of keeping people uh, as safe as we can. And we certainly continue to have um, lots of conversations with faith leaders here in Chicago about how to um, creatively, but as safely as possible, uh, ensure people are able to practice religion. Cranes is asking, uh, there, there continues to be a ban on packaged liquor sales after 9 p.m. Um, 
when the ban applies not only to troublesome locations with a bad history, but uh, something as simple as trying to buy a bottle of wine for dinner at 9.01 p.m. at your neighborhood Jewel. And I guess the question is, um, you know, should that be a flat out ban after 9 p.m. or can we look at trouble yeah. spots and make it more so, specific? So we've really made a decision at this point here in Chicago to think about COVID as a problem of our whole city because it is. Um, there are some places that have tried to target particular neighborhoods or have different requirements in place, but frankly, I don't think that that makes sense, at least with what our outbreak looks like here in Chicago. Sometimes this question comes up around, or a similar question around, should you have you know, more restrictions in place in one neighborhood versus another? And we know that people move across Chicago. We know that people often don't work in the neighborhood where they live. We know people travel for school reasons. And when one part of Chicago is having a problem from COVID, we are all having a problem from COVID. And so to the liquor restriction in particular, you know, I know that, that this is another thing that people have had to alter their behaviors for, but I would, you know, encourage someone in this context, that is the rule. So try to plan ahead um, and, you you are also at this point able to go to you know a restaurant or or other places um, if you are looking to purchase liquor after 9 p.m. But otherwise, that is the requirement across all of Chicago, and we're not going to try to set um, different restrictions for different places uh, based on risk factor. At least not at this time. Um, WBEZ is. Um saying that many southeast side residents that they've spoken with um, in Hegwish say they will not honor uh, this Indiana travel order. What, what do you say to them? So if the Hegwish residents are traveling back and forth from Indiana for essential purposes, for work, for school, they are exempt. And we recognize that that is um, the, right, the right thing to do. But what I would say is that we have no goal here in Chicago except to control the spread of COVID. And that Hegwish area has repeatedly been a hotspot area for us here in Chicago. And I think some of that is because I know that many people in that area do regularly go over the border. And you know, in the same way, if you look at the state of Illinois, the Northwest region, the one that borders Wisconsin and Iowa is the one region in the state that has had, uh, that has needed to have state restrictions imposed on it for high positivity. A lot of that is I think because there are porous borders here. What I would say is that I just want you and your families to be able to avoid COVID. And one of the best ways that you can do that is to not have unnecessary exposure to high risk settings for COVID. And Indiana has, different than Chicago, loosened all restrictions related to COVID-19. And so it's not just that their, their rates are higher, although they are, it's that a lot of the science-based things that we have in place here, ranging from masks to sizes of gatherings to um, distance at a restaurant uh, are currently not in place. And I personally think that that's part of why we've seen such a major increase over just the last week or two in those Indiana cases. Um, I will be the first one to take Indiana you know, off the list as soon as they can come back under control. But all I would say is that I don't want people to unnecessarily get COVID. It's my job to share risk factors. And right now, traveling anywhere um, that is on our quarantine list, but particularly a place that does not have a lot of the restrictions in place that help keep societies open but relatively safe um, is a major point of concern. So. That's my message. Please don't go unless you really need to go. Um, and you're, I mean, everybody makes the decisions that they make, but that's my goal. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.